Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Abraham Villanueva, Marketing and Business Development Officer for SGS Animal Health and Nutrition Sector. And for our next speaker, he is an Associate Professor in the Department of Veterinary Paraclinical Sciences, College of Veterinary Medicine, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Laguna. He got his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of the Philippines in Los Baños in 1992, his Master's in Science from Brussels, Belgium in 1999, PhD in Ghent University in Ghent, Belgium in 2003. He is a swine practitioner and sought after speaker in international and local technical seminars and fora. To introduce to you Dr. Romeo Sanchez Jr. to present our next topic for this afternoon, the future of swine diagnostics amidst ASF repopulation effort. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. The presentation is divided into three parts. And the first part I'll give a short introduction on the current industry status and uh, projections. Uh, I'll give uh, the second part. I'll give perspectives on the uh, disease outlook for the for the country. I'll give some perspectives on diagnostics for these uh, swine diseases, and finally, I'll end with a few take-home uh, messages. So uh, to introduce, to start with, um, the current swine in the inventory in the Philippines uh, is roughly estimated at 55% of the levels before ASF hit the country. So uh, ASF entered the country in 2019. So comparing it with a 2018 swine uh, inventory, we are at 2022, first quarter of 2022, we are uh, estimated only at 55%. Uh, five years from uh, from 2019, so that's 2024. The swine population is expected to increase only by 20 percent, so 75 percent compared to pre-ASF levels. The estimated uh, number of farms that have repopulated is only at 60 percent and will increase by 20 percent five years from now. The estimated um, load or number of pigs in the farm on average is only at 50% currently. So if the farm has a 500 cell level capacity, so most farms are only loading up to 25% of the full capacity of the uh, farm. And this would increase by 20% uh, five years from now. Um, these uh, estimates, are based on the assumption that an effective ASF vaccine, an effective or efficacious ASF vaccine will not be available uh, soon. This, uh, this is the basis of the projections. This is uh, data from a, uh, from a foreign research company. Um, so if you will just follow this, this uh, line, the black line, um, this gives the projection on the production. So before ASF 2018, this is the level of the uh, production. It has dropped, might be leveling out. This, the drop might be leveling out at 2021. But as you can see here at 2022, we are only at 55%. And at 2024, that level will be only 75% from pre ASF levels. No? Also in this graph, you see the consumption. The consumption has declined uh, in the past three years, both because of ASF and the uh, COVID lockdowns. No? But that demand will go up as the, swine pop as the swine population increases. This consumption is driven by the easing of the lockdowns, easing of COVID, and the increased mobility of uh, people. In general, um, ASF uh, is currently dictating and it will continue to dictate the uh, local pig production in the years to come. Now this, uh, 
perspective is based on uh, on, on uh, efficacious ASF vaccine. Now, of course, if an ASF vaccine, uh, an efficacious one is introduced into the market and uh, then the projections will be on the increase in the population will come much, much sooner. In terms of disease outlook, uh, ASF will continue to be the main disease threat. Um, the traditional endemic diseases in the country, PRRS, PCV, associated diseases, influenza, coronaviruses, hog cholera, parvoviruses, iliitis, to name a few. Um, these diseases uh, obviously have disappeared in farms that have depopulated, but as the population in farms increases or in uh, provinces or in barangays as the population increases, then these traditional diseases which have subsided uh, will start to pop up again. And indeed, in my experience, uh, there has been uh, outbreaks of uh, parvo and uh, smedi-like viruses. No? Uh, Eliitis has been uh, observed already, influenza, PRRS, PCV-associated diseases, edema disease, and uh, coronaviruses. This is uh, from an outbreak of uh, SMEDI uh, in, uh, in a repopulated farm. You know, it's quite common because the farms are stuck with gilts with low immunity or stuck with low parity sows. So the immunity is still not there. So you see uh, this quite often. We also, we've also seen in the field uh, acute cases of ileitis characterized by sudden deaths and uh, tar or gray colored or reddish colored diarrhea. Um, I've seen cases of acute uh, swine influenza you know, characterized by uh, febrile disease in, uh, in gilts or in uh, fattening pigs, um, cases of uh, PRRS you know, uh, started to come up again. The disease is characterized by disease in the breeding herd. You know, it's a febrile disease and you can have abortions and respiratory disease, complicated and uncomplicated respiratory disease in the nursery and the grower finisher units. Um, one disease that I have uh, observed, which is a bit surprising, but it's, it's there, maybe just unnoticed, is edema disease caused by E. coli. This typically affects in its acute form uh, the biggest uh, piglets in the nursery, characterized by edema in the upper and the lower eyelids, uh, sometimes in the, uh, in the lips, and you have that characteristic edema in the uh, mesocolon and sometimes also in the gallbladder of acutely affected pigs. Um, there's also resurgence of diseases like uh, porcine circovirus associated diseases like wasting, uh, dermatitis and the prophecy syndrome and reproductive failures. And also um, coronaviral diseases, PEDV, uh, so cause of vomiting, fatal, uh, neonatal diarrhea in uh, naive piglets and uh, diarrhea in the older pigs and even breeders. Perspective on disease diagnosis. For this topic, I have divided uh, disease diagnosis into four steps. One when you're diagnosis in disease in the farm. The first step is examination of the history. Yeah and subsequent uh, examination of the farm, clinical examination, and collection of samples from affected animals, performance of laboratory tests in those uh, samples, and subsequent interpretation of the results. And finally, the eventual uh, design of control and prevention programs in response to these diseases. So I'll give some perspectives on this different uh, steps in the diagnostic process in commercial swine farms. Traditionally, um, pro farm production records and even health records are on a pen and paper uh, 
sheets. No, there are, for some, for most farms, they are on, uh, they've shifted to Excel, but I foresee that in the future, there will be an increased use of uh, softwares, you know, for records, management, rec uh, and production records, you know, so you'll have more uh, organized analysis, organized presentation of data and organized uh, analysis, subsequent analysis of those uh, data. And this will uh, afford for um, more organized examin internal examinations and also organized uh, discussions of the, of the data. I foresee uh, that external, external uh, examination of farms by external consultants will be more regulated uh, for obvious biosecurity reasons. I think farms will be more uh, conscious of letting people uh, from the outside from uh, entering the production areas. So this is for uh, herd history. In terms of sample collection, um, I foresee a shift from the traditional individual-based sampling methods. You know, ito yung pagkolekta ng dugo, uh, tissues from necropsy and uh, nasal swabs. These sampling methods are collected from individual pigs and they are invasive because they are they require a lot of labor, time. You know? I foresee a shift to population-based sampling methods. You know? where you collect samples from more pigs uh, for a given batch, for a given building, you know. Uh, these sampling, these population-based sampling methods are less invasive because they are more convenient to do. They can be done at a, uh, at a faster rate and require less labor. Examples of population-based sampling methods are uh, oral fluids, I'll see, I have some picture, uh, pictures uh, after this slide. Uh, processing fluids from uh, pails, uh, bowls from castration, uh, different kinds of wipes, meat juice, and recently uh, the tip of the tongue. Uh, it's also used to, as a population-based sample. You know? I foresee a shift to a more population-based sampling methods. Uh, so this is a blood collection from a weaned piglet. Uh, this is the traditional method uh, collecting uh, blood. Uh, it's quite laborious. You'll have one, two, three, and four people in this example collecting blood. Um, it's kind of for uncomfortable for the animal and takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, this is uh, another traditional method, collecting tissue samples from uh, pigs. Uh, yeah, I remember that this was taken in Silang, Cavite, and this was in 2004. So I see a shift to Mrs. Natal swabs, another individual based sampling method, where it's a lot of restraint, a lot of labor, you know, and patience. I foresee a shift to population based uh, sampling methods like uh, the use of cotton ropes to collect uh, oral fluids. So here the rope is hung um, in a pen, you know, one rope for a group of pens. The pigs are allowed to nibble into the rope, nibble on the rope and uh, for about 25, 30 minutes. After such time, the fluids and saliva from the pigs are transferred into the rope. And the rope is then squeezed while placed inside a plastic uh, bag and you get that fluid, that's the oral fluid. Um, that is fluid is transferred into a suitable receptacle and that fluid is the one tested for uh, P by PCR for different viruses. In this case, I think it was swine influenza, no? but you can test this as well by PCR for PCV2 for uh, PRRS and so on. The sample can also be used uh, to be for testing for antibodies using the uh, ELISA. So it's more convenient and you can test more pigs. Uh, there are disadvantages, you have the dilution effect and so on. Um, 
this is a collection of oral fluids again this is from recently or to be weaned piglets no this is used to monitor for this example uh, prrs viral circulation in the farrowing units which could give an indication of the stability of the breeders for prrs no? so it's the same you hang the rope leave it for 30 minutes and then you collect the fluids no and here is another example from two farrowing crates no? This is another population-based method. Uh, this is the uh, collection of fluids from uh, processing material. No? So here you have the tails. So peta yung buntot during uh, tail docking, the um, the balls during castration, they're all collected up. And then they are for, uh, you can collect this for a batch of pigs. So you buy some batch, you collect all the uh, tails, all the balls, you know. Uh, you place it in a freezer, you know, and then you allow, uh, you allow the fluids to be uh, expressed and then you collect the fluids and then you test it for PCR, you know, for different viruses. You can also test it for antibodies and so on. Um, this is a newer uh, approach. Uh, this is a more targeted approach for more targeted sampling. This is the collection of fluids from tongue tips. So yung dulo ng dila. Kinokolekta sa mga, hindi sa buhay of course, sa mortality. No? From mortality in the farrowing house and even stillborn piglets. And ganun din, the fluids that will come out, that will be expressed, is collected and tested for PRRS for instance, for uh, PCV2 and so on. So here, this might represent this processing fluid. These processing samples may have come from, uh, I don't know, 800 piglets or 500 piglets. So you, with this method, you get to test for, you get to test more pigs, you know, instead of just one or two samples. This is another example of population-based sampling. This is uh, nasal wipes, you no? Know? So you get a gauze, you can wet it with 5 ml PBS, and then you just wipe the, uh, the snout of piglets, you know, and then you collect all the gauzes, place it in a plastic bag, and then again, you squeeze the fluid, and you can check that for different viruses by PCR. You can also do the wipes on the other, so they then ang inahin. And this would the aim of this is to get the fluids for, again parang sa snout then from the piglets that uh, that suckle the milk. So they have other wipes then you have nasal wipes. Um, I foresee also a change in the way the samples are sent to the laboratory and uh, so these are FDA cards no so here the fluids that were collected uh, this fluid could be could be this fluid, you know, they are blotted into an uh, FTA card. That FTA card is allowed to dry and then it is placed in a uh, plastic bag, Ziploc bag, and the bag is shipped to the laboratory. So it's much easier uh, to send samples to the lab for PCR testing. Um, I foresee a more uh, environmental sampling being done. Uh, more uh, uh, testing of pens, of crates, alleyways, walkways, you know, doorknobs, environmental samples, office floors, farm and uh, building equipment, fans, air collectors, or the blades and electric fan, pit, and water, and so on. So more testing of these uh, things either periodically or before loading of the building or after loading of the building. I also foresee more uh, periodic testing of feed, complete feed, raw materials, clothing, and even medicines that are going to be introduced into the farm. This is an image uh, showing how environmental samples are collected. So you get a gauze, you dip it in PBS or any sterile fluid, and they are this fluid is placed in a bag, you squeeze it, and then you get the fluids. No? The same as in oral fluids. What about diagnostic tests? Um, 
The ideal diagnostic test is one that is fast, mabilis gawin, simpleng gawin, uh, with a high sensitivity and specificity. It means na yung magpa-positive sa test ay totoong positive at yung negative ay totoong negative. And of course, the ideal diagnostic test is yung mura, yung cheap. No? Uh, we don't have this yet uh, in the Philippines. This is an example of our uh, simple test. This is the uh, lateral flow device for ASF. Um, now, diagnostic tests can be classified into two, either agent-dependent or uh, agent-independent. No? Um, agent-dependent tests, ito yung, yung test na gagawin mo ay dun sa sinususpect siya mong sakit. For instance, if you're suspecting that the disease is PRRS, so you use a test for PRRS. No? So, dependent yung test mo dun sa suspecha mo. Examples of this is the ELISA. This is a traditional test and I think it will still be a predominant test in the future. This can be used to detect antibodies. It's popularly used to detect antibodies, but there are formats that can also detect uh, antigens like the uh, antigen capture uh, ELISA for uh, how cholera virus. Examples of a, uh, independent agent-dependent tests are the, the traditional, the classical immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry. The more pop, the more common ones now is the uh, lateral flow device. You know? There is a lateral flow device for antigen, also for antibodies. Uh, it's very convenient to do. You can put the kit in the in your pocket. So, pwede mo itong gawin sa field. So, it's a point of care test or a POC test. Um, another example is the lamp, but it still has to be uh, screened for sensitivity and specificity. Um, I, I see a shift to uh, in the future to more PCR tests being done on samples. No? Uh, there are different kinds of PCR. The traditional PCR is the endpoint PCR. At the quantitative PCR gives you an indication if the sample is positive or negative. You know? And this is a gel-based test. Um, another kind of PCR, and I think this would be more popular uh, in the years to come, this is the quantitative PCR. Most of this makes use of uh, commercial test kits. So there's a PCR for uh, uh, ASF. There's a PCR for PRRS, and so on. And now this gives you this gives you an estimate of the amount of uh, virus in the sample. So quantitative. Ito. The traditional PCRs are uniplex. Ibig sabihin you test. Uh, you do the test, but you only test for one uni, one uh, pathogen, let's say only for PRRS. I see a shift to multiplex PCRs. Ibig sabihin, isang test, pero you test for two, three, four, five different viruses or pathog pathogens at the same time. No? So isang run ng test, uh, lima na kaagad ang tinetesting. So this is much faster to do. I foresee more in the future uh, sequencing and more uh, phylogenetic analysis of those sequences uh, in the future. Yeah, we have this. Uh, this is an ELISA. I thought this is an old test, but it's still uh, very useful. It was taken, I think, in 2003, 2004, when we were doing a study on influenza. Um, this is a new, not new, but uh, very popular test now, the lateral flow devices, for instance, for PRR, uh, for ASF. But you have to take note of, you have to, when you're using this, you have to be aware that of its sensitivity and specificity. It is useful, but you, you have to select your samples, select your animals. And the PCR will be the one that I think will predominate uh, in the years to come. No? Now there are these PCRs can be done either. This is a lab-based PCR, so you do the PCR in the laboratory. Uh, there are now point-of-care PCRs. These are PCRs that you can do in the field theoretically, uh, 
And this allows for nucleic acid detection, uh, not in a laboratory setting. So hindi masya, you don't invest too much on equipment and so on. I think this will also become popular maybe uh, in, uh, in large farms or in cooperatives and so on. Now we go to agent independent test. Ito yung test na when you do it, uh, kahit ano pwede makita mo. So hindi independent ito independent of a pathogen uh, that might be causing the disease. Examples of this is bacterial isolation and virus, virus isolation. These are the traditional agent-independent tests. No? So when you do bacterial isolation, uh, you don't really know what will come up. It could be E. coli, Pasteurella, APP, and so on. Same with viruses. I foresee, I hope in the, in the near future that uh, there will be um, third generation sequencing. No, there is a company now doing this. Um, they make use of the Oxford Nanopore uh, device. Uh, so, and uh, another example of a modern age molecular agent independent test is the Pion viral uh, microarray test. No, I think this is more advanced in plants. Um, the purpose of diagnostic tests. Uh, will still be, uh, I think, um, ASF parin and testing that will predominate, and it's more for government permits. No, I I read the the uh, circular na, na increased na into forty nine um, uh, samples required. Um, that's uh, that's for discussion. Uh, Another purpose of testing is obviously for in cases of acute outbreaks and monitoring of endemic diseases you know, for ASF and for farms that are successful in uh, keeping out ASF, monitoring of endemic, uh, traditional endemic diseases like PRRS or influenza or PCV2 or PED. You know. um, I foresee uh, more uh, monitoring and surveillance, so more testing. No, to monitor disease uh, in the pig, in the feed, in, in the buildings, you know, and uh, so on. And, event and finally, um, so all those examination of the history, all of those sample collection and testing, they should eventually lead to a successful uh, control and prevention program at the farm level. Uh, I foresee that a more uh, that con most of the control programs will be ASF centered. So check for ASF first. Uh, I foresee that control programs will be uh, in the future will be more measurable. No, but it, but you check mo talaga kung in, yung program is uh, is it working? What is the impact of the program that you have created based on your diagnosis? More science based programs, more monitoring and surveillance. And maybe in the near future, more uh, modeling, predictive modeling, and the use of artificial intelligence. So that's my short lecture, some take home messages. Uh, ASF will continue to dictate the future of the local swine industry. You know? This is in the absence of an effective ASF vaccine. Um, traditional endemic diseases are likely to reappear and increase when the pig population increases. Um, I foresee population-based, non-invasive sampling methods to be used more frequently. And finally, monitoring for diseases uh, using molecular methods will likely become popular and intensified. So thank you for your attention. This presentation was uh, sponsored by SGS. Philippines. In a world of rapid technological change, it can be a complex process to successfully deliver high-quality, safe, and effective medicines to market, and there is no room for error.
When you need to be sure, trust the world's leading testing, verification, and certification company to support your drug development product. SGS can help you reduce risks, shorten time to market, and demonstrate the quality and safety of your products with confidence. Backed by 40 years of scientific and regulatory compliance expertise, as well as a global network of GMP certified testing facilities, SGS provides comprehensive small molecule and biologics testing services to support clients from molecule to market through research, clinical trials product development, quality control testing, and manufacturing. Our facilities utilize cutting-edge techniques and technologies staffed by knowledgeable and experienced scientists who stay abreast of the most recent advancements in testing and regulatory requirements in the industry. Our scientific experts enable your success by using innovative techniques to provide better, safer treatments to patients. Whether you need a partner to support you through every stage of the drug development cycle, or just need an extra hand when your in-house capabilities are restricted, SGS is flexible to meet your needs. Partner with the world's leading testing, verification, and certification company to accelerate your products to market with best-in-class analytical testing solutions. When you need to be sure, trust SGS to help you reach your global markets quickly and safely.